everyone, my name is Brianna Bosch and I am the owner and farmer here at Blossom and Branch Farm in Denver, Colorado. We are a regeneratively focused flower farm, which means that we grow to sequester carbon. So we incorporate a lot of cover cropping, holistic grazing practices, and we also incorporate a lot of native plants here on our property to serve the pollinators. So I love getting people into growing flowers. Growing vegetables is a wonderful thing to do, but growing flowers alongside those vegetables is really wonderful for helping to attract pollinators to your garden. But we often get hung up on what do we plant. There are so many options out there, so many beautiful varieties. So today what I've done is I've created a series of bloom blends for you. These are pre-selected varieties that will give you a wonderful cutting garden in a color palette. We're going to go over five palettes today. We're going to do a peachy pinky palette, a burgundy palette, a natives focused palette, a white neutral palette, and a bright and colorful cheerful orangey yellow palette. Now, of course, I'm giving you these bloom blend recipes, but all of these are mix and match. So if you see a variety that you like, write it down and start some seeds. Let's go. The first one is going to be our yellows and oranges. Yellows and oranges are really bright and cheerful colors in the garden, so they're really fun to have for bright pops of color. The first one that we're going to include in that recipe is going to be Rudbeckia. And this Rudbeckia is beautiful. You can see how it has these yellow petals and these kind of reddish orange tones in the center. This is called Cherokee Sunset. It's one of my most favorite Rudbeckias and they're really nice and strong stems. Now these you can start from seed and they're a perennial plant. So they're a really great one to include and they're a pollinator favorite. The next one we're going to be including is a super easy to grow one. Now zinnias are in most of our recipes for these bloom blends. This zinnia in particular is actually called Oklahoma ivory. So it's a little bit more of a yellow. So there's an Oklahoma white, which is a straight white and would also work in this yellow color palette but this Oklahoma ivory tends to go a little bit yellower and so I really like that. Now we're also adding in some of these kind of lighter orangish tones to just give a little bit of depth to this palette. This is a dahlia and this dahlia is called Cornell Bronze and it's one of my favorite dahlias in the ball form. So it has this beautiful dark orange in the center and then as it lightens, it actually fades to a yellow toward the edges. So it really goes well with this palette of oranges to yellows. Now in all of these blends we're giving you a variety of textures. So the texture on this one is kind of more of a spike texture which adds height to your bouquets and to your garden. This is goldenrod and goldenrod is a North American native. It's a beautiful yellow plant and it also is great at attracting lots of beneficial insects. I really really love this one. It comes back on its own every year and it reseeds regularly. So if you don't want it reseeding, make sure you did hit it. Now the next one in this palette is probably pretty self-explanatory, the sunflower. Sunflowers are both easy to grow and they're also really bright and cheerful in the garden. And actually sunflowers can even help fix your soil. So if you have a lot of heavy metals in your soil, sunflowers will actually take that up into their roots and keep it in the stems of the plant. So just a little fun fact about sunflowers. We love to include sunflowers and I like to grow the branching varieties. Now there are a couple different varieties. One is a single stem variety and that means it just grows one single stem and those ones tend to be pollenless. I actually grow the pollen ones and they do tend to make a little bit of a mess as this pollen drops, but I just wipe it up and I make sure I'm not putting it on a white tablecloth and then everything is fine. But if the pollen bothers you, you can grow a pollenless variety. And if you wanted to include a single stem pollenless variety, I would go for one called Vincent's Choice, which is a nice strong stemmed variety. But again, each one of those only produce one stalk and one flower. If you're going with the single stem pollenless, if you're going for a branching sunflower, you're going to get lots of different side shoots, which will let you keep cutting for a long time. Now this next one that we're going to be talking about is not quite as easy to grow because you can't grow it from seed, but they are really easy to grow from what are called cuttings or from plants. So in the spring, you can buy cuttings of chrysanthemums and that's just propagated pieces of chrysanthemums. Now as you get better at growing chrysanthemums, you can propagate them, take cuttings and root them yourself and multiply your chrysanthemum stock that way but you can also just buy them as plants in the spring. So this one, this particular variety, is this yellowish to go with our palette, and this is called Homecoming, and it kind of has this gentle in-curve. So you can see how the petals 
kind of curve in toward the center, which just makes for a really interesting texture in a bouquet. Now this is actually another dahlia. It doesn't really look like the other dahlias because the other dahlia was a ball form. This is actually called an open-faced dahlia, which means it has open petals and there's lots of pollen on the inside, so the bees actually adore open-faced dahlias like this. This variety is called apple blossom. Sometimes it skews a little bit pink and sometimes it skews more yellow, which is nice because you can use it in a couple different palettes. And this one you can see is going a little bit yellower. You can see how it's almost translucent towards the edges and it's just such a pretty pop. Another one that we've included in this palette, this is another Zinnia and this is actually a new variety from the Queen Lime series. And the Queen Lime series tend to have a little bit more of a bicolor, kind of dusty look. And this is the Queen Lime Peach. And so this Queen Lime Peach has that nice bicolor, again, yellowish fading into that orangey in the center, which makes it really pretty as an addition to this bright sunny yellow palette. And the last one that I've included in this palette is a marigold. And I always like to include marigolds in the garden because they're a good trap crop. That means they can help kind of keep some pests at bay in the garden. This marigold in particular isn't like your typical large headed marigold. I like this one because it's daintier and it has a little bit smaller heads and it's more of a spray for a marigold. And marigolds also have a really nice subtle scent which is always a really nice addition to a bouquet. The other great thing about all of these palettes that we're giving you as you're ordering seeds for spring seed starting and all of your bulbs and your tubers is that all of these things are going to be blooming at the same time. So we've actually harvested these from our garden all at the same time, so you can know that they're probably all going to be blooming at the same time versus when you're kind of picking things, sometimes things are blooming in spring, other things are blooming late summer. They might not all be blooming at the same time. These guys are all gonna start blooming mid to late summer and they're gonna go all the way through fall. The only exception to that is gonna be those chrysanthemums. Those tend to be blooming in late summer and going into early fall. The next Bloom Blends color palette is going to be this beautiful palette of whites. So if you are a neutral type of person in your home decor, the white color palette might be perfect for you in your cutting garden. Let's get into all the different plants we've included in this one. So we're gonna start with a zinnia. Again, I always love including zinnias because they're such an easy grow directly from seed. And we have a couple different ones in this blend. One is that Oklahoma Ivory, and the other one is Oklahoma White. So let's look at the differences. And you can see that Oklahoma Ivory tends to have a little bit more of a yellow tinge to it. It's not quite so straight white. And then you'll see that this Oklahoma White tends to be really more truly white. So again, it's nice to have both, and because zinnias are such an easy grow, you can really see the difference when they're next to each other between the Ivory and the white, but it is nice to have both when you have a white blend so that you have a little bit of depth. So we're including both of those white zinnias in our blend. Now the next one we have in our mix is a lisianthus, and you guys know how I love lisianthus. They are kind of a mix between a tulip and a rose, and they come in a wide array of colors. They also have a really great base life. So when we're talking about flowers for cutting, that's always something to consider. So this variety is called Voyage White, and it has these nice little ruffled edges. It's just gorgeous as a texture in this blend. The next one we've included is a Snapdragon. These are not the Snapdragons you find at the grocery store. These are called Madam Butterfly, and they're an azalea double ruffled petal. So they don't just have a single petal like a lot of Snapdragons do. These actually have two layers, which makes them look ruffly and fun. They do tend to have a little bit of a weaker stem, so that's something to consider. They do break a little bit easily. But they are just gorgeous and you can see the detail in this ruffle. The next one, and this is actually a foliage, but it's rare to find foliages that are actually whitish. This is Dusty Miller, and Dusty Miller is a very fun one to grow. It actually perennializes here in my zone if I mulch it with a lot of leaves. So that's a great thing anytime we don't have to replant a seed every year. But it kind of has this silvery, dusty texture to it. And it's just one of my favorites. It gets tall as the season goes on, so it will start out short, but come mid to late summer, it does lengthen out quite nicely. The next one I've included is white yarrow. And I love yarrow, especially in my zone, because I come from a dry, hot zone here in Colorado. We do not get a lot of rain, 
And so everything we grow should be drought tolerant, ideally. <laughs> Not always the case, but I do love to grow easy maintenance drought tolerant things, and yarrow is one of those. Yarrow also makes a great dried flower, so it's good to use in the fall for dried arrangements. One of the easier ones to grow are cosmos, and we do love a white cosmo. Now, I like to grow the fancy cosmos, so these are actually a double ruffled cosmo, and these are called double click snow puff. They come in kind of a range from white to light blushy pink, but they are just a really beautiful flower. They are easy to grow, and they have this really fun frilly foliage. So we'll often just cut cosmos for the foliage in addition to the flowers. This is another one to be careful of. If you don't want it taking over your garden, make sure you deadhead it because it will seed everywhere. Another great chrysanthemum that we like to use is the French vanilla chrysanthemum. So chrysanthemums, we talked about during our yellow color scheme, but it also comes in a white. They come in a lot of different colors. And we do grow the taller cutting version of chrysanthemums, so they're a little bit different than what you'll find at the grocery store in the fall, which tend to be shorter and mound-shaped. These actually get taller and they're better for cutting. So this one is called French Vanilla, and we buy these in the spring as plants or as cuttings. And once you get experience with growing mums, you can actually propagate them all on your own, which is really fun. The next one I like to do is this fun native, and this is called Pearly Everlasting. Don't get it mixed up with another one called Winged Everlasting. That one is from Asia, it's actually not a native, but this Pearly Everlasting is a native, and it's not only good for cutting fresh, it's also good for drying, and it's a really important butterfly plant. So the American Lady Butterfly and the Monarch both use this one. We have two more in our white mix. The next one coming up is actually mint. So mint is a super easy to grow, probably too easy to grow. If you have mint in your garden, you already know this, but it tends to spread and creep quite easily. So make sure you have it in a container or somewhere where it can actually be contained. But when mint starts to bolt, it actually blooms and it makes this beautiful white bloom. Not only do the bees love it, but it works perfectly in our white palette and it has a really good base life. And the last one we have in our white color palette is another one of my favorite North American native plants, Echinacea, also called coneflower. And coneflower is another good drought tolerant blooming plant, another really important one for the pollinators. And it makes really gorgeous cut flowers. So, so many wins with Echinacea. And this one is called White Swan, and this is a cultivar, so it's not the straight native version. Um, it's been bred to have these white petals, and it goes perfectly. It kind of has this creamy white, so again, gives a little bit of dimension to our white color palette. Now the next one is kind of peachy, pinky palette, which I love. It's one of my favorite palettes by far. Um, and it's just so bright and cheerful and fun, and yet it can also be sophisticated. So I really love this one. We are going to start with one of my favorite dahlias. This is called Rock Run Ashley, and she tends to be a little bit of a peachy dahlia. And she is a ball form, so she's smaller and has a better base life. Some of those huge dahlias that are the dinner plates that are really, really big tend to not have as great of a base life, so that's the advantage of these smaller ones. Now there are actually a couple different dahlias in this mix, um, just because so many of the dahlias that we grow happen to be peachy and pinky. This one is Wine Eye Jill. Wine Eye Jill tends to get really tall on the stem. She has these really nice tall stems and a really strong head, so it's always good when they attach really well to the stem. It's something I look for in a dahlia. These Wine Eye Jill, as they age, they tend to get a nice open face to them, and so you see that yellow in the center. They can be pinkier or they can be more yellow. It depends on the time of year and how old the bloom is on the stem. So they can kind of go either color palette. Now the next dahlia we're including is an apple blossom. So we actually included the apple blossom in our yellowy orange palette as well. Again, there's a lot of crossover between these two palettes. But the apple blossom is an open-faced dahlia and it can kind of go a little bit peachy or it can go more yellowy. This one has gone a little bit more yellow but there's peach on the petals. So we're gonna pull this one into our peach palette. And finally, the last dahlia that we're including in this one is one of my top favorite dahlias to grow. This is Jowy Winnie. And Jowy Winnie is a perfectly pinky, peachy color. So if this is your palette, the Jowy Winnie is for sure a winner. They also tend to make really good, healthy dahlia flowers. And they make great tubers, so the tubers store really well over winter. They're one of my favorite to grow. Now, it wouldn't be one of my mixes if it didn't include a zinnia. And you guys know I love zinnias because they're really easy to grow from seed. 
and they're also really, really easy to cut. Uh, they keep blooming throughout the season, so you're never having to, I mean, you can replant them if you want to. You could succession plant them, so you're constantly having new blooms, and that's sometimes a good idea with zinnias, but they're so easy that it doesn't really matter that you have to do that. Note that we do cut ours nice and long, so make sure you're not cutting too short. We have two varieties we're using in this palette. One is Queen Lime Red. Queen Lime Red tends to be a little bit of a dusty pink. And then Queen Lime Orange, which can skew peachier or more orangey. It depends on the time of year. But both of these together make for that perfect pink peachy palette. Now, it also wouldn't be one of my mixes if it didn't include a Lysianthus. <laughs> you guys know how I am about my Lizzie's. I love Lysianthus, they're one of my favorites. This is actually a Voyage Light Apricot, and it's just such a gorgeous one, and it goes really well, it blends with this pinky peachy palette. It can go peach, it can go pink. It could even really go with the whites if you wanted to go with the blush of your palette too. All right, there are two more that we're including in this palette. One is another Madame Butterfly. Again, the Madame Butterfly Snapdragons are different than your mom's Snapdragon. They are not the ones that you find at the grocery store. The Madame Butterfly varieties have this double ruffly layer. This variety is called Cherry Bronze. So there's a couple. There's another one that's called Bronze with White. This particular one is Cherry Bronze. And it has, again, that pinky peachy color palette. It's kind of fading to white down at the bottom. So all of these variations that nature makes are what creates this beautiful palette for us. And last but not least, this one is kind of a tricky grow, okay? Because it's a little bit hard to get germinated. This is cherry caramel phlox. Cherry caramel phlox can be hard to germinate just because it takes a little bit of love. So we like to pre-sprout these in a moist paper towel in a Ziploc baggie until they've germinated and then we put them into soil and that's how we grow these out. So this cherry caramel phlox and the lysianthus are the two trickier ones for this blend and they both like to be started in soil blocks so just be mindful of that. The next color palette is going to be this kind of burgundy almost going into a little bit of brown. So we're going to talk about the components in today's cut flower garden. Let's do it. We're gonna start with basil, and basil is a great one to grow from seed. It's really not very difficult to grow. Now, this is basil that has technically bolted, so it has the bloom on the top. We don't like to cut basil until it gets to this point because if you try to cut it when it's too young and immature, it's just gonna flop in the vase. So we do let it get to the bloom or bolt stage, and we also make sure that the stems are really nice and woody before we cut them and use them. This variety is called cinnamon basil, and it makes this really nice dark purple leaf. I find this one also tends to be really resistant to powdery mildew, so that's always a plus. And so a nice dark purple bloom and kind of a purpley green leaf even. So even the foliage kind of goes with this color belt. Another one that I like to include in this blend is another chrysanthemum. So we talked about chrysanthemums in a couple of our other bloom blends. Uh, the white one had one in there and so did the yellow chrysanthemum. And it really actually has a little bit of brown to it, which I really like. I think it adds a little bit of sophistication to that purple. And this particular chrysanthemum is called Royal Glamour. It is a little bit of a shorter blooming chrysanthemum, but it's totally fine for what we need it for, which is vase work or cutting and bringing inside. You can see it's plenty long for that purpose. The next one in the burgundy bloom blend that we're gonna talk about is Scabiosa. So this one kind of sounds like it's out of a Harry Potter movie, but it's one of my favorites. Uh, for growing is kind of a smaller accent bloom. You can see it's not very big, but when it's in this mix with everything else, it really adds a fun pop. And the scabiosa is fairly easy to grow. We do plant it early spring. We start it indoors from seed. Um, and this one I really like because it blooms all season. You just have to keep it deadheaded and it'll keep reblooming for you from spring until fall. The next one I like to grow for this color palette is actually a perennial. So you have to buy this one as a plant. And this is oregano. So you'd never believe that this is oregano because it obviously looks very different. This variety of oregano is actually called Herrenhausen. And it gets really tall, so you can see how just how long it is when it does bloom. And it blooms this beautiful burgundy uh, at the top, and it has kind of a dark green leaf. 
So it holds super well for bouquets. We also wait to cut this one until it's nice and woody, just like the basil. The next one that we're going to be talking about is a perennial native plant uh, here in North America. This is Joe Pie Weed, Sweet Joe Pie. Now it does tend to get pretty large, this plant in particular. We did start it from seed, you can also buy it as a plant. It also makes these really fun kind of fuzzy blooms. They start out as little buds and then they open up to sort of this fuzzy seed head. Next one up is one of my personal favorites for cutting and drying, but it also does really well as a fresh cut and this is straw flower. Straw flower is such a unique bloom. It has this really cool papery feel. And probably here. We like to cut it at various stages. So if I'm going to cut it for drying, I actually like to cut it before it opens in the center. If I'm going to cut it to use in a vase fresh, I like to cut it when the center is open. It just keeps the heads from flopping over. You can see this one that isn't fully open, how the head kind of flops. So if you wait until they're fully open in the center, they'll hold their heads upright. The next one, queen of my heart, is the Lysianthus. This is Roseanne Dark Brown one of my favorite varieties of lisianthus and you guys know lisianthus are one of the trickier ones to grow from seed but so worth it if you want to give it a try we're going to have a video coming out on just how to do this but they do take a long time we start them around christmas so just as a reminder our last frost tends to be mid-may we start these around christmas and we plant them out four to six weeks before last frost so these are actually pretty cold tolerant. All right, last but not least is another great perennial producer cut and come again flower. So Rudbeckia and this particular variety is called Cherry Brandy. And this one will keep blooming for you all summer long. It has that nice kind of variation in the petals of burgundy. So it kind of bridges the gap of all of these different colors, pulls in a little bit with the browns of this Rosandy Brown. Um, the oregano, you can see how nicely these all go together. The Rebecca is one that you can start from seed or you can grow as a plant. Either one will work. Uh, they are perennial in our zone. They're pretty drought tolerant. They're a really happy plant and they will keep producing. If you keep cutting them back, they are cut and come again flower and they work really well with this palette. So if dark drama purples and kind of browns are your color palette, this is a great bloom blend. These are going to all be blooming together in mid to late summer and even into early fall. So really great for that kind of dramatic dark time of year when we're getting into the fall season flowers. So these are all North American native plants and they are gorgeous if you want the wildflower look. So if you're going for kind of a wildflower cut flower garden, this bloom blend is really going to help you get there. Let's go. So the first North American native that we're going to be talking about today is a little one called yarrow. And yarrow is one of my favorites because it is so low maintenance. It's super drought tolerant, which is great for me in my zone here in Colorado. We're zone six, but we're also really dry. And so this guy actually blooms even better if it doesn't have water. Another one that I really love to grow is called Mountain Mint. And Mountain Mint not only has a really beautiful structure to it, the foliage and the blooms, it also smells wonderful. It's kind of a little bit pepperminty, but it's not as minty as mint is. Um, it doesn't spread as aggressively as mint either, so this one is safe to plant in the landscape. And it's a huge favorite of pollinators. All of these native plants are obviously great for pollinators. But the Mountain Mint seems to be a super favorite. The next flower that I love to grow does also double D. So it can be used as a fresh cut flower, but also this one is edible. This is anise hyssop and it is, it tastes like licorice and it's even a little bit sweet. So the leaves are edible and they're actually really tasty. I like to eat them fresh, but I also like to add them to salads and I like to make simple syrup out of them. They're also extremely beautiful. The bumblebees tend to love these ones and they grow tall. They do get a little bit tall, but they're very structured, so they don't tend to flop as much as some of the other native plants. Another top favorite that I do love to grow is Echinacea, and this is one of our straight native varieties of Echinacea. So Echinacea now comes in a lot of different cultivars, which can be good and bad. The pollinators can't get to the pollen as easily, and those ones tend to be not as good. So watch out for that when you're getting Echinacea, because a lot of them have lots of uh, double bloom qualities, so where they have lots of layers of ruffles. This one, on the other hand, is really accessible for the pollen, and it makes great seed pods for birds, so that's super beneficial in the garden. 
And it has these, I kind of love these little whimsical petals that this straight native version of Echinacea has. And this is Echinacea pallida, and it has a little bit of a pinky tone to it. The next one that I love to grow is one that we definitely don't grow enough of in our gardens, and this is Aster. And Aster is a really important native plant uh, for our native pollinators, and it's really beautiful. These tend to bloom in later summer, and actually all of these things I'm showing you are blooming right now in my garden here in Zone 6 and we are just heading into September, so kind of toward the end of late summer. And this is Smooth Aster, and Smooth Aster kind of comes in a little bit of a purple. It's a very light pale purple, so it's actually really pretty because it blends really well with everything else. Another native favorite is Sweet Joe Pie, and we actually used some Sweet Joe Pie in another one of our bloom blends, the uh, burgundy one, because these colors are a little bit in that palette, especially down near the root. They're a little bit of more of a purple. One of my personal favorites, this is Pearly Everlasting. And not only is the name adorable, it also serves a, a quite a few purposes. It is actually one of the important host plants for the American Painted Lady butterfly and also the monarch. And it's a great dried flower and it's great fresh. So, so many good purposes for this one. This one's a little bit unconventional. It's really more of a grass, but grasses can be really fun to add into your cut flower garden, not only for the kind of textural element that they give, but also the height. So this is Northern Sea Oats. They're really adaptable to lots of different soil types. And then in the fall, they get this bronzy hue to them. So right now they're still green, but they will turn this bronzy color as they fade. Next up, we have what's called Rattlesnake Master, which I know is kind of a funny term, but it has this almost glow to it as the blooms are white. So it's hard to tell, but there are some white blooms here on this. And again, really popular with the pollinators. It has kind of a thistle look and pollinators tend to love thistles and they love this one a lot too. Again, this one was called Rattlestick Master, also called Oryngium. And last but not least, we have one of my favorites because it's so cheerful and long-lasting in the garden. This is Brown-Eyed Susan. These blooms last for a really long time in our garden. So I believe these started blooming in early August and it's almost mid-September and they're still blooming. They look almost brand new. They are very pretty. They don't get too big, so this is great for a native plant. They tend to not get very tall, and they're drought tolerant. The great thing about all of these is that they are North American native, but always remember to check and make sure that they are native to somewhat similar of a soil and a zone that you are in. So, for example, if you're in a moister zone, then some of these might not work very well because they tend to not like super wet soils. A great resource to check is nationalwildlifefederation.org. They have a native plant finder that you can use by your zip code and they will tell you which ones will grow in your zone. But if you're looking for a great and easy guide, go with this bloom blend of North American natives. There is something so lovely and special about growing your own cut flowers. Not only can you bundle them as a bouquet and turn it into a beautiful gift, it also is a great thing to bring into your home as a reminder of nature or to leave out in your garden for the pollinators to enjoy. If you want to learn more about our growing practices, please tune into our YouTube or our Instagram where we give lots of information on regenerative gardening.